So, as James said, today I'm here to talk to you about the emergence of hybrid optical and packet networks and some of the core concepts that are supporting improved scalability as we look to meet the demands of the future as networks continue to grow. Before we jump in, a quick bit of background about myself. I've been involved in telecom and data center businesses for the last 12 years, and I'm currently working at Titan Telecoms, a niche telecom service provider specializing in optical deployments across Australia. Previously, I founded a company called ColoAU with my business partner, Brad Hooper, and went on to work at 5G Networks as wholesale manager post its acquisition of ColoAU. So let's talk about building networks. We've got a three-side example on the screen with a pair of fibre and grey optics used to link each of these. Every link needs a dedicated fibre on the assumption that we're doing 10 gig LR or 100 gig LR4 and using 1310 or grey optics. Historically, growth means adding more and more cores of fibre and more and more grey optics. There are significant limitations in operating costs, be it lease of the underlying fibre assets or the fact that every pair of fibre requires one or more cross connects, an ever increasing cost for the majority of people in this room I can imagine. This is further complicated in a high capacity world with the limitation of things like device uplink ports or the fact that distance between POPs and data centres is getting further and further apart. So what are our alternatives? With the in introduction of pluggable coherent optics overlaid on an optical line system through industry standard form factors like QSFP28 or QSFP DD, the convergence of an optical transport network and traditional packet networks allows us to overcome a lot of these challenges. In this example that we have on the screen, we have it's the same three-side example, this time, however, connected with a single pair of fibre between three optical nodes and then multiple links overlaid over the top to our routers using coherent optics to bypass the need for any additional equipment like transponders. So you might be asking, what exactly is an optical transport network and what role does it have to play? At the heart of photonic networking lies the underlying optical fiber. This serves as the medium for transmitting light between two points. And unlike traditional copper wiring, for transmitting light signals, we use pulses of light, which allows much faster data transfer and much lower latency. Photonic networking utilizes various optical devices such as lasers, modulators, and photo detectors to generate, manipulate, and detect light signals. This light-based signal processing is essential for the conversion between electrical signals and optical signals used in transmission. Wavelength division multiplexing is another core concept with its variants of DWM, being dense wavelength division multiplexing, or CWM, coarse wavelength division multiplexing, allowing us to shoot multiple light or colors over a single fiber pair, increasing the amount of underlying capacity that a network has available. Optical switches and routers also allow us to direct the path of light pulses through the network without converting them back to electronical signals. This can be incredibly important to bypass and, and lower latency across a backbone. Optical transport networks have long been a thing, and I'd imagine the majority of the people in this room today are utilising services that rely on, un on DWM as an underlying transport medium, be it intercapital transport networks that are linking major Australian states or submarine cables linking Australia to the rest of the world, WDM has been a major component in supporting networks globally. So why do we need to scale our networks? Over the last couple of years, there's been unprecedented growth in the terms of capacity due to things like artificial intelligence, streaming, or creative industries like gaming, as well as the fact that last mile connectivity has become extremely available with speeds over one gig being explored by providers like MBN. Pluggable coherent optics allow us to solve some of these gaps by providing a fast way to grow and scale networks over the top of a common backbone. So let's jump into some of the fundamentals that support optical networks. An optical transport network consists of a number of basic building blocks, such as wavelength division multiplexing, or WM, optical amplification through 
erbium doped fiber amplifiers or Raman amplifiers, wavelength selective switches in their form of rotum, as well as transponders who historically have carried the bulk of long haul connectivity. Optical transmission uses various transmission bands as represented on the diagram. With the first window being our legacy multi-mode band, historically not really used for much anymore other than uh, in-rack you know, compute. We've then got the second band or our 1310 all grey, which we typically use for the majority of applications like 10G LR or 100 gig LR4. The third window, the C band, historically used for DWM. And the fourth window, the L band, being used for CWM and increasingly used to extend DWM networks. The fifth band, or the S band, has historically not been used in optical transmission. However, future applications are being explored. Wavelength division multiplexing, or WDM, allows for multiple independent wavelengths to share the same fibre pair. As represented on the diagram, these are generally referred to as different colours, with each colour being a different wavelength. WDM can be deployed in multiple topologies, such as point-to-point, -point, ring, linear add drop, star, or mesh. Through the use of a multiplexer, passive devices that allow, multiplexers are passive devices that allow the combination of different wavelengths so that they can pass through the same optical fiber pair. In this diagram, we can see each color is being dropped off into an individual port and then onto a single, then being combined onto a single colored network interface, carrying all wavelengths between two points. We then have the demultiplexer at the far end, splitting this up so that we have, once again have our individual wavelengths accessible. Now when designing an optical transport network, or really any network at distance, optical attenuation is one of our key factors when determining the type of amplification that's going to be needed. Attenuation is typically caused by signal loss over the fiber, which can be due to things like the underlying quality of the fiber itself, Splices, patches, panels, components, muxes, amplifiers, anything in between. The diagram here, we have an example link with a budget of 24 dB, with a launch power on the left-hand side at positive 1. Over the course of the link, the end point is negative 23 dBm. Optical amplifiers are one of the critical building blocks compensating for attenuation over large distances. Typically, only the DWM C band has been the focus, but of recent time, the L band has returned in popularity as an effective way of expanding WM transmission capacity. There are two types of amplifiers that are commonly used. Erbium doped fiber amplifiers, or EDFA for short, or Raman amplifiers. Amplifiers typically have three common implementations, a booster being at the start of a link, an inline amplifier being in the middle, or a pre-amplifier being at the end of a link. EDFA amplifiers are the most common deployed around the world. EDFA amplifiers work by having a section of fiber doped with erbium ions. The rare earth element has unique optical properties that with the application of a pump laser injects energy into the erbium doped fiber, exciting the erbium ions at a higher energy state. When the erbium returns to a low energy state, they release the absorbed energy in the form of photons at a wavelength around the 1550 nanometer band, or the C band. This process is known as stimulated emission, and EDFAs can provide anywhere from 5 to 10 dB of gain at the low point, or 20 to 30 dB of gain at a high end. In an example here, we can see an example link with an inline amplifier deployed between two mux dmux locations. For this example, we can assume that the distance between the two sites is over 80 kilometres, necessitating an inline amplifier in between to ensure enough light reaches the other side. We can see on the left-hand side that we're launching at a relatively high amount of power, and as attenuation is applied across the link, we can see that prior to the inline amplifier, the signal has decreased significantly. Following the inline amplifier, we can see that the EDFA has significantly increased the wavelength's power, albeit at the cost of some added noise on the system. Another amplification option for long haul is Raman amplifiers, preferred for long spans and high data rates. 
Unlike EDFAs, Raman's use the actual fibre as the gain medium rather than fibre doped with erbium. Raman's achieve their, Raman's achieve their amplification via stimulated Raman scattering known as SRS. Raman's can typically be placed at the end of a link as a backward scattering Raman, one of the most common deployments, or at the start of the link as a forward Raman. In another worked example, we can see a long-haul fibre link marked in red. It's travelling over 220 kilometres with a launch power of positive 20 dB. We can see that it's dropping to negative 35 over the distance, which is going to be too low for us to use. We can then compare this to the green link, which travels the same distance but has a backward scattering Raman applied. This amplifies from the 220 kilometer mark back to 160, applying 15 dB of gain over the last 16, after, over the last 60 kilometers of the link, therefore allowing us to get from A to B with negative 20, and therefore we can do something with that. Raman amplifiers, however, have a couple of trade-offs. They consume 100 times more power per dB of gain than an EDFA. This can be typically very difficult in locations where utility power is not guaranteed. And since Raman uses the transmission fibre as the gain medium, the fibre is very important. On the right hand side, we can see an example of a couple of different fibre types and the amount of gain that can be applied from a Raman amplifier. We can see single mode fibre typically used in all applications compared to some specialist fibre like TrueWave or Leaf designed for long haul applications and high gain from amplifiers. Now, as a slight segue, I want to impress upon you the importance of clean, high-quality connectors when using high-powered Ramans, when using high-powered amplifiers, especially Ramans. Due to Ramans' extremely high power gain, damage is easily caused. On the screen, we have a link that we built that we damaged both cores of fibre. The left core, there's a transmit core. It didn't have a backward scattering Raman applied. And on the right hand side, we had a Raman applied. The damage on the screen you can see is the fibre core is effectively burnt. This was caused by a flat UPC connector in a data center cross connect, connecting to APC terminated street fibre. This caused excess scattering, leading to, leading to significant damage, and eventually the pigtails had to be replaced. For comparison's sake, that's what it should look like. Another core piece of equipment in modern optical networks is the reconfigurable add drop module or Rotom. In an example here, we can see a couple of pairs of transponders and a three site optical line system that the transponders will transmit over. Between the transponders, we can configure a specific wavelength to go from one transponder to its partner transponder through our optical line system. We can also configure multiple wavelengths over the same Rotom between different locations, allowing for efficient connectivity. We can also remotely reroute wavelengths should an underlying fibre cut or an issue in between two optical line systems occur. This can provide us with a lot of benefit in trying to overcome outages or damage to existing networks. Rotoms rely on liquid crystal on silicon technology or LCOS. This is typically the same technology that's used in some consumer LCD TVs. And LCOS acts as a smart mirror, controlling which light beams or wavelengths to add or drop at the Rotom. Now, in an example of how our Rotom can route light from multiple sources over to a single network interface, we have a network interface denoted as N that's carrying all of our colored signals down a point-to-point -point link. And every time we add a new signal, that Rotom routes a specific wavelength to a client port and back to the network port. This provides us with maximum flexibility as we add two, three, or more optical links over the same path. This allows us to keep adding more and more links over the same point-to-point -point connection until the spectrum is entirely used. In an logical example of how two Rotoms will operate, We've got an east and a west Rotom deployed, and then we have an opportunity to route a wavelength directly through, or to pop it out via our multiplexers on site, and this will allow us to route through a pop to another pop, should we not want to terminate it there. 
Historically, the majority of WDM networks have deployed transponders to carry bulk capacity over a WDM backbone. At a high level, a typical optical transport network consists of dedicated transponder modules with non-pluggable, fixed, coherent optics. A transponder will deliver one or more grey or 1310 services on its client-facing side, carried via a single network wavelength over the WDM backbone. This may be multiple 10 gig services or multiple 100 gig services, depending on the configuration. Here we can see an example transponder circuit with the grey optics connecting on the left hand side to our equipment. And then the transponder is performing the three R's, reamp, reshape and retiming before aggregating multiple signals and sending them over a single wavelength. The transponder example in this case could be configured at 200, 400, 800 or higher speeds providing bulk trunking capacity between two sites. In this example we've gone with 600 gig and whilst beneficial if you want to move a lot of data from A to B, this can leave you with unused capacity if you don't need it there. This solution also adds an extra layer of hardware adding capital cost and ongoing operational costs in rack space and power usage due to the use of a fixed transponder. So this is really where pluggable coherent optics are an absolute game changer for networks going forward. In this example, we've replaced the transponders in our previous design with coherent pluggables. By removing the transponder layer and moving to a common form fact pluggable like QSFP ZR Plus or QSFP DD ZR Plus, 100 gig and 400 gig interconnects between POPs can be carried over the same common optical transport network. This leads to a massive cost rationalisation through lower cost per bit, as well as effective spectrum usage in the C and L band. It's also less complex as it's compact in an optic and we don't have to manage any other equipment or pay for any more space or power to deploy it. So how can we look at applying some of the efficiencies and benefits of an optical transport network in the real world? As a real world example, let's take an MBN retail service provider who's connecting four points of interconnect back to a common aggregation point for core or subscriber aggregation. For best practice, we've used an east and a west path from each POI to provide diversity, leading to the use of eight fibre pairs or 16 cross connects and 16 cross connects. Whereas if we overlay this on top of an optical transport network, it looks something like this. This time we've deployed a ring topology using coherent ZR plus optics over the top of our optical line system. And here we can see that one underlying fiber loop exists compared to eight dedicated fiber pairs. Each POI still receives its two connections with an east and a west path, as well as as well as the potential to route if there is a fibre break. One of the massive design benefits of optical transport networks is that we can abuse rotums to restore a wavelength on the affected path via an alternative path, allowing for all of the point of interconnect capacity to be online despite the fibre cut, albeit at a diminished resilience. This is a great example of how we can move the failure from the layer three side into the layer one side. This also means that we're not gonna be taxing the routers as much and so we're going to maximise the available capacity that each POI has. This does also provide us with the potential to save on some edge equipment as points of interconnect as the level of function required in those boxes is diminished. I'd really like to thank the Osnog Program Committee for this opportunity, especially James D. Trapani and Michael Hobble in assistance in the presentation, and I'd further like to thank Jonathan Mantell and Tony Thomas from Adtran and all of Team Titan for their assistance. I'll now take a few questions before wrapping up.